are back. I'm your host, Barry Waxler, here with uh, Andrew Kay and Urban Miaris, and we have our next guest with us, a uh, gentleman I've known for a good number of years, uh, Mr. John Smaha from Smaha Law Group. Welcome, John. Yes, thank you for having me on the show today. I appreciate it. Great. So tell us, um, there's there's so many different aspects of law and, and what uh, different attorneys do. Tell us a little bit about your practice. Well, it's a very diverse practice. Uh, I've been uh, practicing law now some 34 years here in San Diego. Um, we've been involved in a lot of things uh, uh, all those years of, of helping people largely that are in uh, financial trouble, mm -hmm. also businesses. Uh, trying to help them uh, reach their potential in terms of either a reorganization or some protection of their assets or how they're going to dispose of their assets sometime later in life or right. during their death. Well, tell me a little bit about what, what does that mean when we uh, protection protection strategies are protecting their assets? Well, it's pretty easy easy concept if you think about it. If someone has got a judgment against somebody and everything you own is in one house, let's say, uh, that's here in San Diego. Uh, once they get the judgment, they record an abstract, and that abstract covers that property, and then there's nothing that you can do with it. Right. So a lot of times I talk to people about the fact that if you're going to hold assets, and you have a lot of them, uh, whether it's business assets or money or liquidity, uh, that it's good to have things in smaller baskets and not have everything in like a big target that you could throw a dart at a balloon and pop it like that. So asset protection oftentimes uh, relates to the way things are structured. Just the way that you hold your assets uh, largely can affect the ability of someone to uh, kill the whole deal. I mean, right. they might be able to tax one little piece of it, but they may not be able to tack all of it at the same time. Well, when I think about asset protection, you know, I think two different, two different, almost two different extremes. You know, you think of uh, people in business, and you want to segregate your business assets from your personal assets, and also think of people with great wealth that want to protect what they've what, what they've earned or what they've accumulated over their life. Um, is there an in between in there? Well, a lot of people don't really understand the concept that you can have what we refer to as upstream liability and downstream liability. So a lot of times you want to have businesses that might have some risk to them, maybe a risk of failure, right. be in a situation where you're protected from downstream liability. But you also want to worry about a situation where someone could come after you personally, and then that would affect your businesses in an upstream type, type methodology. So the, the middle ground really is that you need to have things separated uh, to protect both the upstream and downstream liability. Right. Well, this is all part of uh, planning, and, and planning's what what I've been involved in for almost 30 years. Um, you know, where you you have to have a plan to move forward, or or a plan to protect yourself. So, um, tell us a little bit more about your what you know. How does uh, when we talk about asset protection, how does asset protection and estate planning tie in to each other? Yeah, actually, they uh, they tie in really well because. Uh, you need to have a long-term plan for what you're going to do with your assets. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they go through life thinking everything's fine, they haven't had any illnesses or, or something like that, but uh, things can come along very quickly and uh, it changes everything. So you want to have a situation where you know where things are going to go and who's going to take care of them or how they're going to be sold or whatever that is. Well, when you put together a good estate plan, a lot of that also includes the protection from the upstream downstream liability and it also protects you to make sure that those assets go where you wanted them to go not where somebody else wanted them to go or or fight over them or right. whatever that is and and by you dictating that you get to do that well you do that through wills and trusts and that's right. that's estate planning interesting well you know what um uh, i'm going to bring up uh anonymously of course one of uh, my clients that we we're working on right now you know here's here's a client and this is interesting most people don't realize how common this is um, the client is uh, it's a second marriage uh, in the first marriage the mother supported the daughter uh, with uh, college funding uh, or college aid and generated a, uh, a large large debt which over the course of deferment has turned into a huge debt okay and the husband, uh, the new husband brought into assets, brought in a retirement plan, brought in a home, brought in a number of things. You know, so, John, tell us how, how you deal with somebody like that, because you don't want the old marriage to affect the new marriage. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, uh, as part of planning, a lot of people do uh, types of premarital agreements or they do postnuptial agreements. Mm -hmm. And those agreements are, are effective to make sure that um, a liability of one spouse, say premarriage, doesn't get affected by the fact that they may be earning community property income after the marriage. Um, and also the way you hold your assets. If all of a sudden you get married and uh, one person has a debt and you you have everything in one joint account, then it's a, it's a prime place to be attacked. Mm -hmm. um, but just by either keeping some of your accounts separate, which is you know legal to do, or it could be your separate property and have an agreement that says that is your separate property or your earnings from your work is separate property, and then you don't need to worry about the fact that the debt from the one person, whether it be, in this case, an educational debt or, or an IRS debt, or, or some type of tax debt or something like that, that it would cross over the line and then uh, all of a sudden your new spouse finds that they've inherited your your uh, your uh, debt problem. That's right. a, a lot of people worry about that and it's very easy to deal with it. I've got a question. How? What percentage of prenuptial agreements are women wanting to protect their assets from men? Particularly, like I'm thinking in today's culture, we got a lot of cougar situations going on out and there. Older women, younger men. There's plenty of women that men. came out of a marriage with a lot of assets going into a second marriage. So that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a lot of that. I, I think that that primarily what I see is the person that has the most money is the person that's usually asking for the premarital type agreement. And how often is that the woman as opposed to the man? Um, not very often. Although although you'll see it. Uh, Sometimes it's 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 its own whole uh, horror story in a way because a lot of times it's not brought up by one of the spouses or the you know until right before the marriage and that causes a lot of problems with trying to get it done and things That's like exactly that. That's exactly what happened with Real Housewives in Atlanta. If you watch that, I'm not kidding you. With Candy, any of you have seen that? It, it's a real problem. I mean, she br she brings it out like practically at the rehearsal dinner. Not a good plan. Right, yeah, I mean, John. It, yeah, I mean, get it out earlier. Right? Ask them all the time, like, why didn't you bring this up earlier? It was like, well, if I brought it up earlier, they probably wouldn't have married me. So I don't know. <laughs> it becomes a problem. <laughs> you know, How another uh, thing that I see quite often is, uh, you know, people start a business with with a long term plan, and as they uh, mature in business, uh, as well as in age. The business develops and develops more than they ever expected, and then they have uh, offspring, or their legacy is unable to, shall I say, uh, accept the business because of a disability. Uh, we get that, such as autism, uh, uh, where we have one family now in San Francisco, uh, their business is quite large, and their only child is autistic on SSI, supplementary income, so uh, their child, if when and if they pass on, uh, the, the legacy of it is, is ended with them. Uh, so setting up a trust and all that has been uh, probably the way for them to go. Yeah, they do. I, we, usually in that kind of situation, you create what's called a special needs trust. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, by doing that, you can try to uh, find professionals that, that could handle the business or could handle their financial affairs for them and make sure that they're cared for during their entire life. And it's, it's a very standard type trust, and it, it's done, done a lot, but a good thing to do. Yes. You're listening to Close Up on San Diego Business here on uh, KCBQ, streaming live at am1170theanswer.com. Give us a tweet at CloseUpSD, email me at barry at CloseUpSanDiego.com, or find our page on Facebook. We want to hear from you. I'm your host, Barry Waxler, here with my co-host, Andrea Kay, and Urban Miaris, and our guest is Mr. John Smaha from the Smaha Law Group. Um, so, uh, John, people come to you for a lot of different reasons. We've talked a lot about estate planning and, and asset protection, what have you. Um, I guess this is another form of asset protection, if you, if you want to call it that. But you'll handle people, help people out, just get into corporations and LLCs and what have you. That's all part of your practice, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Uh, a, a lot of the work that I've done over the years is actually Chapter 11 work, where we would actually uh, do something for a business. Uh, or a chain or a restaurant chain or something like that to reorganize them. But um, uh, because we do that kind of work, a lot of our clients that reorganize stick around and then they start creating new businesses. And so right. we've taken care of that. And, and as it, over the years, it's worked out really well to continue to help businesses, uh, it, whatever that is. It's whether there's a real estate transaction or it's uh, creating a, an operating business or putting people together so they can operate and develop something. And so we do a lot of that kind of work too. So it fits hand in hand with the uh, with the uh, practice. Great. 
Great. Now, it looks like you have uh, an award, one of the uh, top lawyer awards you've gotten that, uh, is that just last year? Yes, uh, I think that uh, I, I was picked to be part of the best of the bar uh, process there um, uh, for what I do, and I was Great. very pleased to be able to have that award. Uh, there was a limited number of attorneys that were were able to do that, so it was it was finally nice to be recognized that way, and um, I, it was really nice. Congratulations. I'm I'm curious about how you got into this particular type of a practice because I don't know how many people think, hey, you know what, I'm going to take the LSAT and I'm going to go to law school to get into asset protection. You know, most people have like the dream of being like, you know, racehorse Haynes or you know something like that. How how did you fall into this particular specialty? Um, it was actually a, a, an interesting story, but when I was in law school, I was part of a law review. I got picked to be part of the law review, and I had to write an article. And this is back in the uh, 78, 70, you know, that time frame. And what happened was the bankruptcy laws changed. It went from the Bankruptcy Act to the Bankruptcy Code during that time. So I picked an area of law to write on and got published, and it was in that area. So then uh, to do that, I had to interview people at the bankruptcy court. And after I was going along and getting ready to graduate from law school, I was down at the bankruptcy court doing something as part of that process. And one of the law clerks for the judge at that time, who was Judge Katz, um, asked me if I was interested in being uh, a law clerk. Uh, they had just opened up positions to do that. And I said, well, this sounds kind of interesting to do, and, and actually the pay was fairly good, and uh, he took me in, and I met the judge, and he gave me the job, and uh, that was kind of history from there. So that, that's how I became a primary bankruptcy lawyer, because I worked for the bankruptcy courts for two years. And then uh, because the law had changed, not a lot of people knew the new law, so it was fairly easy for me to build a private practice right off the bat when I got done with the bankruptcy court after two years. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, you know, there's there um, because our population is getting older and older. There's another area of the law that I think is becoming really, really uh, prevalent, um, and that's the uh, elder care. Um, so absolutely, and and you've got some strategies to help out the the uh, elder uh, elder community to protect assets, correct? Right, absolutely. And again, it's it's the same thing. People don't know what they need to be doing to make sure that there's a progression of their assets and transfer of 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 whatever the care or whatever it is. Well, there's a, you know a continuum of care that seems to happen, and and a lot of people don't know what to do. So uh, there is a, a lot of this going on, and, and also. An adjunct to that is uh, prevention of elder abuse. Um, a lot of times, uh, people that have money, uh, their kids take advantage of them, or one child takes advantage of them, and the other child thinks that there's a problem, um, and, and it needs to be dealt with um, more and more, particularly because of the aging of our generation. And uh, so I've been working along with another group of attorneys here in town, and, and we're going to be putting together a little more of a continuum of care kind of program where we also can be a one-stop shop, not only to do the asset protection and the estate planning, which goes hand in hand with that, but also be able to assist them in being able to find the resources they need to make sure that everybody understands what that continuum of care is and what you can expect now versus five years from now versus 10 years from now, what the options that are available. There's been a lot of great facilities now uh, for people for independent care or even assisted living. It's, it's, it's not the old convalescent home that they remember. A lot of these places are kind of like cruise ships uh, on the land, really, and there's a lot of activities and things to do, and people can actually live very meaningful and, and uh, interesting, fun lives uh, in, their, in their elder years. Like right. Cocoon. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the um, uh, when uh, when would people uh, when would the elderly be eligible to start working for this? Is because you know I stop and think you know if you have somebody who is uh, up in the years they have all these assets but then they come down with an affliction like Alzheimer's what have you is it too late to deal with them at that point? Well, it's not too late. I mean, they have to be competent to be able to do whatever they're doing. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to get a conservator or something for them. But that that is really not when you want to be doing it. Right. Th I think that people, by the time they're in their 50s, should be seriously thinking about what is their progression going to be. And if and a lot of times, actually, we get contacted by people that are in their 50s that their parents are in their 70s. They're like 70 or 75, and they're saying, "Hey, my parents don't have an estate plan, or I don't know what they, I don't know what they have. They never told me about it." 
and uh, that's a time to get involved. But if you if you're doing it for yourself, I'd say definitely in your 50s. And if you got uh, parents that are in their 60s and 70s, and you want to make sure that uh, they're going to get where they want to get, uh, you should be right. trying try to do it now. Great. Well, we're starting to run short on time, so tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you. Well, they can certainly call us at 619-688-1557. Uh, we have a website. It's maha.com. And uh, welcome to hear from you. Great. Well, thanks for being with us. Uh, been very informative. I, I look forward to getting together with you and telling more of this story because it fits right into what we need in this county. Well, again, thank you very much for having me. Great. Uh, this is Close Up on San Diego Business here on KCBQ, streaming live at am1170theanswer.com. Send us a tweet at CloseUpSD or just find us on Facebook. You can always email me at barry at CloseUpSanDiego.com. Let me know what you think. I'm your host, Barry Waxler. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Take care of me. 